Greetings, Central Atlantic Conference of the United Church of Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We welcome you this day to Sunday worship, celebrating Trinity Sunday. We come to celebrate the God who by grace created us, Jesus Christ, who by love redeemed and reconciles us to God and the Holy Spirit, God's power that enables us to be the people of God, bringing forth God's reign of love, peace, and justice into a broken world. We welcome you. If you are in River Edge, New Jersey, we welcome you in Roanoke, Virginia. We welcome you in Walkersville, Maryland. We welcome you in Dover, Delaware. We welcome you in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. We welcome you in Northwest DC. We welcome you Central Atlantic Conference from wherever you are. We do that because whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. In that spirit, my friends, I invite you to join me in this call to worship. Come into this household of the living God, the three in one. Gather in the wonder of the mystery that God has invited us to share. We have come as the family of Christ, led by the Spirit of God. Ascribe to the Lord divine glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory and honor that is due God. Our hope is that in this time of worship and learning, we might embrace what lies beyond our imagining and our understanding. So my friends, let us worship and celebrate this day, something that is not just an event long ago, but a reality in this time. Let us worship God, the triune God, in the beauty of holiness. Gracious God, as we gather for worship today, we come before you as we are, bringing what we have, hearts that love you, minds striving to learn of you, wills receptive to the leading of your will. Energize our worship with your Holy Spirit. Open our ears to hear news that only you can make good. Fill our souls again with the joy of our salvation, as only you are able to do, so that we might sing your praises and tell of your glory, both in word and deed, in this world and the next. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Change. 
sisters and brothers. Our God is merciful and compassionate, slow to anger and filled with unfailing love. God is close to all who call upon the Lord in truth, listening to their cries for help and offering them salvation. So let us bring our confession before Almighty God, knowing that the Lord will hear our prayers and forgive us. Let us pray. On this Trinity Sunday, O Lord, we confess to you our divisions. We confess our fear of the rush of your Spirit in our lives and what he might call us to do or to be. We confess our desire for homogeneity masked in the myth of harmony. Our comfort with one language, one lifestyle, even when you transcend all languages, all lifestyles. We confess our actions and we confess our inactions that fail to recognize that the Spirit burns like fire in the hearts of those seeking justice and rushes like wind in the breath of those demanding accountability. On this Trinity Sunday, O Lord, Help us take down the barriers to your spirit. Guide us to live with joy, abandon, and faithfulness, and create in us a new heart to be new people who worship only you. Amen. And now, my sisters and brothers, believe this gospel. In Christ Jesus, we are forgiven, and then go forth to live in peace with one another. Amen. This morning's scripture comes from Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 8. And it reads, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in the attendants above him. Each had six wings. With two, they covered their face, and with two, they covered their feet, and with two, they flew. And one called to the other, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots of the threshold shook as the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraph flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin has been blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, Lord. Send me. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.
for this morning, I'd like to take a few moments and speak to the topic of duck preachers in duck churches. Worship happens wherever God is radically present, and the result is unplanned, unrehearsed, and uncontrolled. Let us pray. Hide me behind the cross, O Lord, that they see less of me and more of you. Hide me behind the cross, O Lord, that they hear more of you and less of me. Hide me behind the old rugged cross, for it is your will that is to be done. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. You are the rock. You are our strength. You are our redeemer. Amen. Soren Kierkegaard tells a parable of a community of ducks rodling off to duck church to hear the duck preacher. The duck preacher spoke eloquently of how God had given the ducks wings with which to fly. With these wings, there was nowhere that the ducks could not go. There was no God-given task the ducks could not accomplish. With those wings, they could soar into the presence of God the Creator. Quacks of amen were heard throughout the duck congregation. At the conclusion of the service, the ducks left commenting on what a wonderful message they had heard as they waddled back home. Too often would-be worshipers waddle away from the worship just as they waddled in, unchallenged, unchanged. Perhaps it's because we are creatures of habit. Week after week, we sit in the same place, in the same pew, follow or order a service that we know by heart, listen to a sermon which we assume is intended primarily for someone else. Occasionally, though, something happens, unplanned, unrehearsed, uncontrollable. In the midst of the worship service, worship happens. Someone's heart opens to a deeper awareness of the grandeur of God through the majesty of the music or the spoken word and new commitments are born. Someone recognizes his or her life as the scripture lesson is being read, and new, um, a new believer is born. Someone hears as if for the first time about the forgiving love of Jesus, and new hope is born within them. We may wonder why such happenings occur in their church, but not in our church. Or maybe why does it happen to that person, but not to us? But the experience has taught us that these events can't be explained, only described. Now, the central character in this week's text is Isaiah whose call to prophetic ministry came during an annual worship celebration. For him, the encounter with God was so profound that afterward he never saw himself or his people in the same way again. To Isaiah, it seemed that the entire building shook with the presence of God. Did anyone else share this experience? Did this worship affect how they saw themselves or how they saw God? And how can more than one person hear the same music, same prayers, same sermon, and one be utterly transformed and everybody else waddle out the church unmoved? What makes this worship service so profound for one and so routine for others. The text suggests that God became radically present. The word radical here means awesome, as the event transcends the ordinary in every aspect. Occasionally, we may hear it said that as Christians, we are called to 
a radical discipleship or radical obedience to Jesus Christ. That is, as we be, as believers, we are called to live lives different from the world's culture by seriously and intentionally following the ethics of Jesus. Therefore, to speak of God as a radical presence is not to deny that God is everywhere present but rather to describe those occasions when the reality of God's presence burst into an individual's consciousness in an unusually powerful way. Let me say this it, like this. When God is radically present, God bursts into the situation. Let's say it is in a worship service. You begin to hear things in a way you've never heard them. The music touches you in a way it never has. What's being said touches you in a way in which you've never heard it before. This is the radical presence of God is when you feel like the roof of the church is going to open and the whole host of heaven is going to descend. That's the radical presence of God. The radical presence of God cannot be controlled or programmed. It can only be experienced. And this experience can come to us anywhere and at any time. For Isaiah, it happened in the temple. But God does not limit holy moments to holy spaces. For Moses, God's radical presence was discovered in the wilderness, on the backside of a mountain, when he found the burning bush. For Saul, it was on a bounty hunting excursion to Damascus. When he was knocked off the ass and he heard the voice asking him, Saul, Saul, what are you doing? This was a radical presence of God. And the most radical experience of God's presence is the incarnation, which begins in a stable and ends at the death between two criminals. We must understand that the radical presence of God is found not only in the extraordinary, but in the ordinary as well. God can be as profoundly present in the sunset as in the place of worship. God can reveal the divine self in a concert hall as vividly as in a moment of prayer. More importantly than where we are is our willingness to see God in what is going on around us, going on in a worship service, in a Bible study, in a prayer meeting. Isaiah was engaged in an ordinary service of worship, seeing and hearing the same things as everyone else. When God broke through the ordinary to reveal the divine self as radically present, thus Isaiah went from experiencing worship to experiencing God in worship. It is difficult for us to achieve such awareness as we are a society which celebrates the sensational and the spectacular. If an event is not filled with more glitz and glamour than what came before, then there is always going to be disappointment. Nowhere is this more seen than in Hollywood, where each succeeding production has to have bigger and better pyrotechnics and special effects than its predecessor. No one would have continued to go to the movies and put money down to see the Iron Man series if all that was offered was the same scenario, the same villain, and the same explosions. It had to be new. It had to be original. It had to be bigger. It had to be better each time to keep our attention. This attitude, unfortunately, infects the church as well. It is reflected in our architecture, 
church programs, and annual celebrations. We tried to make each worship performance, and yes, I said performance, because unfortunately, we have had to put some oomph into our worship services to keep the attention of the people sometimes. But it should not be a performance. It should be exactly that, worship. Because when we do worship, we don't have to worry about drama. All we have to worry about is how the people are going to feel when they have come in contact, when they have been touched by God. But I have digressed. Let me go back and say, we try to make each worship performance more dramatic than the last as though through our efforts, the efforts of the musicians and, and, and the choir and the deacons and the preacher can actually command the radical presence of God. Beloved, it's not going to happen. Unfortunately, we are consciously or unconsciously educating an entire generation of believers to waddle, not fly. We teach them to waddle when we teach them that God is to be experienced only in the ornate and the spectacular. Guess what? God shows up when God gets ready. And in teaching people how to waddle, we overlook the possibility that in the ordinary, God can be radically present and that God's radical presence can once again take over the situation and that true worship happens. True worship happens when we let go and let God take care of the situation. True worship happens when we stop seeing the barriers that can stop us and start seeing the possibilities that God gives to us. God said that he would remove the stumbling block. So if God told you that the stumbling block is going to be removed, then keep moving forward. But again, I digress. Worship happens when the grace of God meets human inadequacy. The radical presence of God caused Isaiah to recognize, perhaps for the first time, the spiritual shortcomings of his Judaites fellows and himself. Under King Uzziah, the nation of Judah had experienced an almost unprecedented period of peace and prosperity. Life was good. The economy was robust. The polls showed high consumer confidence and all of the economic indicators pointed to more of the same. Everyone was soaring high, or so they thought. What they missed was that although they were doing good, they could have been doing better had they consulted God. It's easy to see why Isaiah's message was ignored. Who wants to listen to someone tell them that they need to depend upon God when they believe that everything good that is happening and has happened to them was because of their own efforts and not God's blessings? Let me say that again. Who wants to listen to someone tell them that they need to depend on God when they believe that everything good that is happening and that has happened was because of their efforts and not because of God's blessings? Maybe this is why we experience ineffective worship services, too. We are content with our small portion of the world and even the condition of our churches. Nothing needs to change. We only need God to come in and, you know, clean up around the edges of our lives. And we certainly don't need or want God's radical presence to reveal the inadequacies of our neatly manicured existence. This is because we only want to meet God on our own terms, and God does not do that. 
Can you imagine the spiritual satisfaction of Isaiah and his fellow priests as they believed they had captured the essence of God in their religious ceremony? However, as Isaiah soon learned, when one confronts the radical presence of God, all claims of wisdom, goodness, and self-sufficiency melts away. And one is left wishing for a pair of seraph wings to hide one's nakedness. Isn't this the message of the parable of the Pharisee and the publican? Remember, one speaks of how righteous he is, but ends up talking to himself, while the other is met with the radical presence of God because he knew that it was only in the presence of of the most holy that mercy is, was, and always will be his only hope. Let me say it again. When we come humbly before God and fess up to what we have or have not done, God will meet us. God knows the desires of our heart. God knows the hope that we have for a better day. So when we come understanding that we're not running this, God meets us where we are. Rest assured, God does not reveal the divine presence simply to overwhelm us or to make us feel worthless. Rather, God's presence is to remind us of God's empowering grace that meets and transforms our rareness, our awareness of personal inadequacy. As soon as Isaiah confessed his and his generation's uncleanliness, scripture says a hot coal was placed upon his lips to symbolize the justice and the compassion of God to purify him and render him fit for service, which leads us to understand that the that only because of his confession was God able to use him. It is important to note that God's question, whom shall I send and who will go for us, was not directed to Isaiah, but rather to the attending seraphim. Isaiah simply overheard the question and immediately stepped forward. One would say or think that we should question his sanity. After all, God didn't say where the whom was was going or what the task was. But gratitude prompted Isaiah's response. Gratitude for God's grace, forgiveness of sins, experiencing God's presence unlike anything he'd ever known before, and gratitude that prompts a positive response to God's actions, which causes worship to happen. Oftentimes, we misuse the terms law and grace in our conversation of the Old and New Testament. Overemphasis of these terms leads to an unfortunate and inaccurate view of their use. An equally valid way of viewing all of the scriptures could be summed up in the terms call and response or grace and gratitude as all of God's actions are movements of grace, as many of God's actions are called, calls require a response. Sometimes our response is to ignore God's call or to decline the invitation of grace. More often, our response is one of active obedience born out of the sense of gratitude. In gratitude, the Hebrew people were obedient to the law as their response to God's grace in choosing them. In gratitude, the Christian community is obedient to the teachings of Jesus as their response to God's saving grace. In gratitude, Isaiah accepted God's call to represent the divine one to Judah in response to God's cleansing grace. Tony Campolo tells the story of a young woman named Nancy who gratefully responded to God's movement of grace. Although Nancy is confined to a wheelchair, she has an extraordinary ministry. Every week in the personal section of her local newspaper, she runs an ad that reads, if you are lonely, 
or have a problem, call me. I am in a wheelchair and I seldom get out. We can share our problems with each other. I'd love to talk. She spends much of her day on the telephone talking with the more than 30 lonely and discouraged people who call her each week. When Campolo asked how she came to be confined to a wheelchair, Nancy revealed that she had tried to commit suicide by jumping from the balcony of her apartment. However, instead of dying, she ended up in a hospital room paralyzed from the waist down. One night in the hospital, she said Jesus came to her and very clearly said, you have had a healthy body and a crippled spirit. From this day on, you will have a crippled body, but you will have a healthy spirit. She said, I gave my life to Jesus that night in that hospital room, and I knew that if I kept my spirit healthy, it would mean that I would be of help to other people. And so I do. No one is touched by God. Who is touched by God can remain idle. No one who has experienced the grace of God can remain silent. No one who hears in their hearts the divine call for service can do anything less than respond with gratitude. Here I am, send me. And in moments like this, worship happens. And the quacks of amen became the shouts of the ducks who heard and answered the call and soared high into the heavens to meet God as the children of God. Amen. Good morning, Central Atlantic Conference. We now come to that time in our worship service where we have the opportunity to approach the throne of grace and mercy, our almighty God, to seek wisdom, to seek guidance, to seek love, when we need it most. Please join me in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come to you at this time in this worship to approach you, O oh dear God, with needs, with cares and concerns. But before we petition you, we give you praise and we give you thanks not just for what you have done, but for who you are, our rock, our redeemer, the one who shows us how to love, how to be in relationship, and to do that through the greatest sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, and through the power of your Holy Spirit. We give you thanks for who you are and for what you have done. We pray now, dear God, as we continue in this worship service that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon each and every person, oh dear God, who approaches you with great concern and needs upon their hearts. We know, oh dear God, that the task that is before us is simple, to come and to lay them here at this altar, knowing that you are more than able and capable of fulfilling and meeting every need. So we come with that spirit, with that hope, with that faith and belief, oh dear God, that you will do what is necessary to care and to love your people. We turn it over to you right now, dear God, cares and concerns that your people have upon their hearts about this ongoing pandemic of COVID-19. Yes, oh dear God, it has been a long journey. One long, oh dear God, and filled with mixed emotions, 
roller coasters of ups and downs, but we know, oh dear God, that you have been faithful to keep us. And we pray, oh dear God, and ask that you would continue to comfort millions, oh dear God, who have lost family and friends in this pandemic, knowing, oh dear God, that no life, oh dear God, should be taken for granted and that we are faithful, oh dear God, to remember them at this particular time and to lift up their family members who still may be grieving and wondering and have questions of why. Reassure them, oh dear God, of who you are. Surround them, oh dear God, with the love and the care that they need in this season of life. And continue, oh dear God, to guide us in this season, oh dear God, so that we, oh dear God, may be faithful to all that you've called us to do and to be. And that is to be an example of your love, both privately and publicly. We pray and we lift up those, oh dear God, who have cares and concerns about family members and friends, oh dear God, who are in the hospital, who are sick and shut in, or who are experiencing great care and need for their bodies, for the disease, oh dear God, that is taking hold within their bodies. We pray and ask, oh dear God, for a spirit of healing to be upon each and every one of them, to let them know, oh dear God, that you are the great physician, that you, oh dear God, can still do miracles, that you still, oh dear God, can be the same God that you were thousands of years ago, even right now. So move in a mighty way, we ask, dear God. Meet those needs and meet the needs of those, oh dear God, who continue to suffer, oh dear God, economically in this pandemic, from unemployment, from low wages, oh dear God, from wondering whether or not going back to a typical nine to five is truly where you're calling them to go and to be. May a spirit of discernment and wisdom, oh dear God, fall fresh upon those who need it right now, who are wondering where they should go. Be with those, oh dear God, who continue to suffer from the realities of damaged relationships, for mismanagement, oh dear God, of loving, those who are close to us, who are near and dear to us, oh dear God. Give us the pause that we need to acknowledge and to value those who are in our lives and to set our footsteps, oh dear God, right now in a way in which we can express our true love for those who are near and dear to us. We lift up, oh dear God, those who are suffering in this world, we recognize there is so much that are happening right now in this world, oh dear God, from the conflict that is taking place continually in the holy lands of Palestine. It falls, oh dear God, under that ism of racism, of white supremacy, of white supremacists, oh dear God, continuing to colonize and to hate and demean human life. We pray and we lift up, oh dear God, the suffering that your people are continuing to experience on the border. We pray and we ask, oh dear God, for a just pathway so that your people may be able to live fully into this human experience loving one another, caring for one another, taking care of their families, not experiencing cages, dehumanizing acts and violence. We pray and we ask, oh dear God, that you would move in a mighty way in their lives. We pray and we continue to lift up your beloved church, oh dear God, those who you have called to be the bomb in Gilead, in the midst 
of a sin-sick reality that is so present and evasive in so many people's lives. Give us the courage that we need, oh dear God. Give us the strength that we need in these times. Give us, oh dear God, clarity so that we may know what to do and that we will do it, oh dear God, knowing that you are beside us, walking with us, talking with us, and that you've already given us what we need to be faithful in this ministry of the gospel. We wanna pray and we wanna to continue to lift up those who are hurting for the loss of loved ones. We heard of so many, oh dear God, in our community of faith here, the Central Atlantic Conference. And we continue to lift up all of those in our communion who have lost family members, whether it's husbands or wives, partners for life, aunts and uncles, nieces and nephews. We pray, oh dear God, that you would comfort them, surround them with your love, your embrace. We pray all of these, oh dear God, and so many more that are on the hearts of your people. You know each and every need, and we just ask right now that you would move in a mighty way to deal with the circumstances and the needs of your people. We give you thanks and we give you praise because you, oh dear God, are our joy our strength, our present help in a time of trouble. This is our prayer that we offer and lift up to you in the mighty name of the one who taught us how to love and how to pray. Our God, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. And we all say together, amen. Let us continue our worship now by bringing to the Lord our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have given us more than we need. We return these gifts as evidence of our gratitude. Bless them, we pray, that they might empower us to lead and to let your love shine in all the dark places of our world. Receive these gifts as evidence of our commitment to love you by loving our neighbors, that your unconditional love for your entire creation might be known throughout the whole world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
It is appropriate on this Trinity Sunday to proclaim our faith in the triune God as the Central Atlantic Conference. So from wherever you are, I invite you as the body of Christ to proclaim with me in heart or in voice the statement of faith that is of the United Church of Christ. We're going to do this in the form of a doxology. We believe in God, in you, O God, eternal spirit, God of our Savior Jesus Christ and our God, and to your deeds we testify. You call the worlds into being, create persons in your own image, and set before each one the ways of life and death. You seek in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. You judge people and nations by your righteous will, declared through prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Savior, you have come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death and reconciling the world to yourself. You bestow upon us your Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the church of Jesus Christ, binding in covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. You call us into your church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be your servants in the service of others, to proclaim the gospel in all the world and resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in his passion and victory. You promise to all who trust you forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, your presence in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in your realm which has no end. Blessings and honor, glory and power be unto you. Amen.
My siblings of the Central Atlantic Conference, please receive this blessing. Look for the signs of God's holiness everywhere. Listen for the sound of seraph wings and voices. Feel the trembling beneath your feet that heralds heavenly voices. Know that these mysteries have already entered your very lives and beings, children of God, more mysteries yet await you. May the holy and mysterious God visit you. May you be blessed with that mystery made known to us in the love of Christ. May the Holy Spirit, God's breath, God's ruach, give you every strength with its mysterious power and peace. God bless you all. Amen.